was like right when everyone was getting to the first, I guess it was the first church service of the new year, there was like, there was like eight people here, including like myself and the other usher. <laughs> it was like, all right, this is like, I know it felt weird when we came up after um, after the, the, the sermon at the end. And I'm just standing there with my mask on. I'm like, oh, I guess I can't. I need to take this off. Morning, Downtown Hope. My name is Emily Kmo. Thank you for joining us in person here and online. Today we will be continuing in our series, Outpouring from the Book of Acts. If you're new here, we are so grateful that you decided to gather with us this morning. At Downtown Hope, we are a family of believers being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ for the sake of our city and world. We would love the opportunity to connect with you. So if you look in the seats in front of you, there's a connect card. If you want to fill that out and put that back, we'd love to grab a cup of coffee, get to know you, and learn more about how we can serve you as a community. Now, if everyone would please stand and join me and the body of believers around the world and the collective reading of scripture, please read along with me. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Good morning, Downtown Hope. Excited and glad and just happy to be here with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Jacob. I should have started with that. Um, one of the worship leaders here. And uh, uh, yeah, if you would just join me in singing the doxology. 
Sing this morning. Just uh, I'm gonna sh- share my, I guess what's been on my heart uh, in, I guess putting these songs together. Um, so Joey's speaking on the outpouring of persecution this morning, and uh, specifically in Acts, uh, the passage that you know describes the stoning of Stephen, and uh, it can be a heavy passage. But I think what stands out to me and what struck me is verse 55. It talks about you know Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven uh, and saw the glory of God. And I just think that's such a good uh, description of what we should, uh, how we should approach a life, you know, with that confidence in Christ um, and just that, you know, sure knowledge because of him, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Um, we can face persecution. We can face trials. Um in John, uh, in John, Jesus, you know, promises that, you know, we will have troubles in this world. You know, being a Christian isn't a lack of trouble. It's um, promised to us, but Jesus has overcome. And what we're singing this morning. Uh, so all these songs are just proclamations of, of faith and, and just um, and thankfulness that Jesus is with us in the hard times and the difficulties and the darkness and even when we can't see it or to understand why things are as they are we can still rest uh, in Jesus
sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
interest in his righteousness You can take your seats. As a community group leader here at Downtown Hope, and I want to lead us now in a time of confession. In Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you. So let's take some time now as a community in the quiet of our hearts to confess our sins to the Lord. The Apostle Paul quotes the verses of this psalm. In Romans translation, puts it this way. He says, Oh, what joy there is for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Paul goes on in this passage to say that this blessing, this joy, this righteousness is for us who believe in Jesus. And then he says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, We have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have peace with God. But I would also like to encourage us to confess this sin to other believers at some point soon. Whatever sin you just confess silently in your heart should also be confessed out loud to another believer. Forgiveness comes when we confess to God. Healing comes when we confess our sins to others. We cannot hang on to a false appearance with God, but pretend that we don't need forgiveness, pretending to others that we do everything right. God is glorified when we remind each other of our need for his forgiveness. The prayer team is in the back available if anyone wants to pray now. And I invite everyone to stand back on our feet as we worship through song and praise God for this blessing and this forgiveness that he gives us through Jesus.
it to work it even when I don't feel it to work it you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it to work it even when I don't feel it to work it you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it to work it Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? How's everyone doing this morning? Fantastic. We are just glad. The scripture says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so it's a privilege, it's a gift for us to gather this morning, whether we're gathering here in person or with our family and friends online. What a joy it is that, the, that you know, God himself would bring us together this morning to worship him. Uh, my name is David. I serve as the executive pastor here. And again, for those who this may be your first time here or uh, new to getting connected to Downtown Hope, again, we want to welcome you. Welcome to Downtown Hope. A little insight about Downtown Hope. We are a family of faith, a body of believers, as Emily said, that are being transformed. Our lives are constantly being transformed by what God is doing in Jesus Christ. And so many people in this room uh, have experienced that and are experiencing that. And the desire of this local body is that that transformation that we understand to be gospel transformation. Uh, we want to see it impact the city we live in, see it impact the world we live in. And so if you're new or looking to hear more about this vision and the mission the Lord has given, uh, we'd love an opportunity to have a cup of coffee with you. Um, and so there are connection cards in the seats in front of you. You can fill one of those out, either put it right back in the seat or put it in our offering box and someone from our team We'll be in touch with you about our next coffee time. Um, and there is one today after this gathering. Um, we'll meet probably in this corner and we'll head over across the street to Park Deli and uh, grab some coffee, eat some sandwiches, and they have some killer baklava. So if you're into anyone into baklava, all right. So uh, if you're good, if you're coming, uh, come, uh, come to hear about what God is doing, but also come for the baklava. Uh, and that would <laughs> make us uh, extremely excited. And we just love an opportunity just to connect us into this community. Um, and, and then another thing that's taking place in February, every Sunday in February, after our second gathering, we'll be having our membership class. It's called Gospel for Life. It's four weeks. We'll really spend time equipping you 
to be a disciple, what that means. Uh, we talk about the five practices found in Acts that we've been talking about over the past, past few months. And, and then we'll equip you to make disciples. Membership class, uh, you can fill out the card and let us know. Just write Gospel for Life, and that will indicate to us that you want more information about this gathering. Um, and, and as it relates to this vision of gospel transformation for the sake of the city, uh, we have many people who have their eyes and ears to the ground, just listening and seeing for opportunities for our body to, to just be on. So I'm going to invite Joey up, who's going to share a little bit about an opportunity that we have to serve the Lord. So Joey, welcome. Thanks. It's good to be here. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Um, so, uh, Janice Keating, who's part of this body, uh, is one. And um, what we discovered this last week uh, is that there are 40 families who are living uh, in two hotels near BWI Airport. Um, these families are refugees from Afghanistan. Um, they came here a few months back when everything happened in Afghanistan, and they've been living in these hotels at this airport. Um, pretty much under the radar. There's been a few people caring for them, but they really have nothing. And, um, and so Janice and a few other women have come together and about three times a week right now, they're just sort of grassrootsing it and bringing fresh produce to these families and some basic supplies that they need. And, um, you know, what we've been praying about and, and a little bit of the backstory is um, when this thing called the COVID-19 pandemic happened a couple years ago, anybody remember that? Um, back in March of 2020, it's like not a funny joke at this point, is it? Um, but, uh, but what happened, a really actually amazing thing happened in our county, and that is um, we had the opportunity to bring a coalition of churches from across our county about coalition the lord allowed us to spark a number of pop-up food pantries which many of you were part of and have and continue to be part of well i was talking with aaron who really took the lead on love aco uh this week and he thinks this is a time to bring these local churches back together and the vision that we've been praying and thinking about is what if every uh, what if 40 churches in anne arundel county adopted one of these families for the remainder of 2022 we provided housing for them and then a, a, a local church could um, help them to get uh, what we call the long welcome into the U.S. Um, to gain, um, you know, social security cards and license. And, and we have a call today at 1.30 with an organization that helps refugee families, and we're going to get more information. Um, if we are going to move forward with that broader vision, um, one of the particular needs is to have somebody on the team with us who ha is exceptional with communication and coordination. <laughs> um, so we would want to get word out to these churches and uh, encourage them to join us in this. Um, so if, if you happen to have a few hours during your week margin, you're gifted in that and you'd like, it's probably a short-term project over the next couple of months to help us, um, you can shoot me an email. It's just joey at downtownhope.org. Um, and you can uh, also, you could join us today at 1.30 if that's something you're interested in. Um, at the very least, I think as a local body in the days ahead, we'll be coming alongside of one of these families. Um, and uh, so just want to pray to that end, um, if you would join me. Father, thank you for um, the truth of the gospel that when we um, were outcasts, when we were uh, strangers in a new country, um, Lord, you pursued us. You came after us. When we were on the fringe, um, Lord, you came in love and you died for us and you resurrected from the grave and you gave us new life. And so, Lord, we want to be a demonstration of that love to our world and particularly to these families. And so we pray for each one of these families. Um, Lord, it must be really hard and scary to relocate into a new country after uh, living through such conflict. We thank you for our country and the opportunity these families have to be here. And we pray that um, your body, your people across our city, uh, the people of Jesus through Downtown Hope and other churches, um, we would seek your mind in how we can best serve and welcome these to um, our country well. Um, we pray they would see the gospel. We pray they would hear the gospel from us. Um, we pray, Lord, that um, uh, they would see you, Jesus, above all. And we pray this in your name. Amen. As we greet one another, our uh, children can be dismissed to their classes, and let's pass the peace with one another.
into the dark Cause that's just the kind of God you are When heaven seems beyond my reach You still see eternity in me Kind of God you A are A seat? It's in the empty tomb It's on the rugged cross You're All right. Hey, good morning again. It's Great to be together. And welcome to those who are joining us online. Um, we are so thankful to be together here. This morning, we're continuing our series called Outpouring uh, through the book of Acts, the, where we began a few weeks ago at the beginning of January. And uh, let me just, I, I had a conversation with a friend this last week, and this was kind of unbeknownst to him. And I, so I just want to kind of make it remind us and help make it clear, how do we study the Word of God as a church? Because um, our encouragement is that we would be a people, and we know some people are here for the first time kind of just getting to hear about Jesus and his message. Some of you have been walking with Christ for many years. Some of you are just totally stagnant in your faith. We can just be honest about this. Um, our practice here is that we have a great discipleship resource called The Daily that men and women contribute to in our body. And so we're, we are studying verse by verse every um, part of what we we're studying as a church on Sunday mornings through the daily. Um, we would encourage you, subscribe to that. Be in the Word. Do not get past those basics of just allowing, allowing your heart, mind, and imagination to be nurtured through the Word. We discuss this in our groups, um, and then when we come here on a Sunday, we're focusing in on a particular passage of the section that we've been reading the, that week. And so this week, we're jumping into Acts, the latter part of Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7, and this is the account of the stoning of Stephen, um, which some of you may or may not be um, familiar with, but hopefully by the end of this morning, the next few minutes, you will get familiar uh, with it. So... Um, the passage is, it, it spans a chapter and a half. We're just going to read the last part of chapter 7, but then we're going to use that as a jumping pad to jump back into the first part so we get the whole story. So you with me? Uh, there's very few slides here. I'm being intentional with this because we want you to be activated here and engaged. So, um, you know, you don't get to just come sit in a soft chair and just kind of like, you know, be comfortable and be wowed. Like, this is work here. This is formation here. Um, we're serious when we say that on that journey. Um, so if you're open and you're willing to engage, let's do that together. Sound good? Chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. And this jumps in at the end of the narrative, so if you're confused, we're going to go back, okay? Just track with us here. This is at the end of the account. They were enraged. This is a group of religious leaders, we'll find out. And they ground their teeth at him. This is Stephen. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness saw. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in this and sisters who are joining us from their living rooms online. Thank you for those who are here, who are hearing about your word. Your years. We know you've brought each of us into this room this morning to speak to us. We thank you that your spirit speaks through your word, and we ask that you would speak to us this morning, and the things that are from you that I share would be remembered and taken to heart, and the things that are not would be long forgotten. And we're asking and we're acknowledging the power of your Holy Spirit here with us. And that you would surface things in our lives that need to be considered, 
you would convict us, you would comfort us for those who need comfort. And we ultimately just submit to you, Lord Jesus, as King this morning. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So at Christmas this year, um, Katie and I finally gave in and said, this is really what I want for Christmas. Does anybody know what this is? Uh, like everybody knows what this thing is. It's amazing. Same at the first gathering. What is it? One person doesn't know. It's a, it's a Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Switch. For those of you who didn't know, now you know. And, uh, and, and you know, Christmas morning was glorious. Christmas was glorious. I mean, Katie and I were like the best parents in the entire universe. I mean, and, and our son just loved playing on this thing. I mean, all Christmas Day. It was just amazing. And he j- it, was thr- it thrilled his heart. And then I remember December 26th. And the, 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 the reality that, oh, we don't get to play on this 24 hours a day. And when that reality hit, I mean, you, when, that, when, this, th- when this little device was taken away, you might have thought that the world was coming to an end. I mean, it, it was a freak out moment. I mean, there was anger. I mean, he ground his teeth in anger <laughs> towards us because this thing was taken away. And we might say, oh, that's children. That's just children. That's just how children are. But isn't this in some ways the, um, the, the temperature of our cur- current cultural moment in a way? Do you see the threads of this? Just consider the vindictive rhetoric over the past couple of years. And whether you lean more conservative or more progressive, there is a lot of hate and a lot of anger, and there has been a lot of teeth grinding going on. And maybe maybe you're part of the teeth grinders. Are you with me here? You can laugh about that because I know I certainly have at certain moments the level of offense of being offended at our little corner of the world, in my experience, is at an all-time high and some of you are even offended that I bring this up. <laughs> okay. and, and why is this? What, what is going on? How, here's the question, how can we move through our disappointments and, our, and, and the places where we're offended and our missed expectations or when we have been wrong or when we feel like we've been violated, how do we move through those without unleashing our vengeance upon others? And this account of Stephen Stoning offers us an astonishing vision of a more dignifying and humanizing response when something we care about so deeply is threatened or taken away from us. So, so let's look at this passage in three movements. I'm just going to give us three words. They're not going to be on the screen behind me, okay? So you have to work at it here again. So the first word is exposure. It's the first thing we see in this passage. The second word is vengeance. And the third word is forgiveness. Exposure, the threat of our idol taken away. Uh, Vengeance, our response to that threat. And then forgiveness, this alternative response. So let's first look at this word under the heading of exposure. Verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Again, this is a group, we're going to learn more about them in a moment, a group of religious leaders, and they are just grinding their teeth at Stephen. Now, I want to jump back a little bit here and just do a really quick recap to catch us up, okay? Acts chapter 1, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He is of Jerusalem, okay? And you have this moment in Acts chapter 2. It's this beautiful picture of the church, and they're just living this ideal life together in Jesus. And it's like, it's like Christmas morning a little bit. It's beautiful. And it's where we get our as a church. Um, just really a, an amazing picture. But then something happens in Acts 3 and 4. There starts to be this murmuring from among the religious leaders in Jerusalem because this little sect of Judaism and this little band of people who start talking about Jesus Christ as somebody who was killed and raised from the dead starts to begin to create problems. So, for example, in Acts chapter 4, verse 2, we find out that these religious leaders are greatly annoyed. Um, Then in Acts chapter 5, after the apostles are arrested and then freed, we find out in verse 33 that these religious leaders were enraged and they wanted to kill them. Okay, so, so you feel the, the temperature rising on the intensity against these Jesus followers. 
Acts chapter 6, David preached to speak about us utilizing our gifts and getting in our sweet spot. And we find there that the word of God increased. Disciples are multiplying. They're reproducing all over the city. There's a buzz around the city. And then we find out that even some of the Jewish priests are now starting to identify Jesus as the Messiah. And this starts to create, and then significant happens in this account that we're reading this morning that actually uh, sparks the rest of the narrative of Acts as we're reading. And what we find in this in this account, and we're going to go back now, if you want to follow with me back to chapter 6, verses 8, we find this person... Uh, named Stephen. Stephen was one of the seven that was chosen that we learned about last week. And we find in verse 8 of chapter 6 that he was full of grace and power, and he was doing great wonders and signs among the people. We find then in verse 9 that some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, says Luke, they were Cyrenians and Alexandrians and those from Sicilia and Asia, and they rose up and they dip- disputed Stephen. Okay? So this is a group of religious leaders in a particular synagogue who start to have beef with Stephen. I mean, they are upset about what he's saying about Jesus. But it says, verse 10, they couldn't withstand his wisdom. He was so smart speaking by the power of the Spirit. So what do you do when you can't win an argument with somebody? You go to, like, less... Um, you know, honorable tactics, right? So what they do is they start instigating people around them, and they start stirring up the people in this cynic. They set up false witnesses, verse 13, who said this, this man, Stephen, never ceases describing Jesus. Uh, Jesus from Nazareth, nothing good comes from Nazareth. Will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. So there's three things here that they are accusing him of. He's speaking against the temple, the place where they worship. He's speaking against the law, the the code that they adhere to with their entire life. And then he's also speaking against Moses, like the big prophet from the Jew- from Jewish history, who's like the one everybody's looking to. And, he, and, and this, this guy, Stephen, is saying he's going to change. This Jesus is going to change the customs that Moses gave to us. It's like, oh! <gasps> Like you can just feel like the gasp in the air in the synagogue among these leaders. I mean, this is, this is I know it may not be deeply offensive to you right now, but we're going to get to what might be deeply offensive to you. But for these leaders right here, it was an absolute change, and it was really frustrating. They're really angry with him. So then the high priest says in chapter 7, verse 1, are these things so? <laughs> okay, so they, the, these Jewish people have brought Stephen in now, in front of the high priest, and the high priest says, give us your defense, Stephen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grossly summarize this, and I'm trusting and hoping you've read this through the week. If you haven't read it, go read it, because it is, it's the longest speech we have in Acts. It's, it's, it's stunning. It's beautiful. And, and there's such, I mean, in essence, what Stephen says is he says, guys, you're accusing me <laughs> and accusing Jesus of messing with the law and messing with the temple, and messing with Moses, but you all are actually the ones who have never kept it from the beginning. I mean, that's the summary of what he says. Let me just s- just highlight a couple points here, okay? Um, he says in, uh, for example, at the beginning of the speech in verses 1 through 8, um, Stephen starts, and he, he says, way back before the temple, God called Abraham. Before the temple was even intact. In fact, Abraham wasn't even in the promised land is what Stephen's saying. I mean, this is so offensive. He's like, God spoke to a man, not only outside of the temple, not only before the temple, not only before the law, but actually not even in the promised land. They were in a foreign land and God was speaking. Okay, It's a, it's a rebuttal. He's saying, look, it's probably not all about the temple, and it's not all about the law. And then he goes on in the second part to address Moses. And again, this is a gross summary of it, but in essence, he says, Moses, you guys, you know, you revere Moses as a prophet, but let me remind you, the people rejected Moses too. And, and, and then uh, verse 39 and 40, fathers o- refused to obey him and turned to Egypt to make gods and idols. And so Stephen is just building an argument here. I mean, he's he's picking a fight in a way. 
And he just goes on and on and on. And then he comes to this climactic moment. We come to this climactic moment of his speech. And it's right before the section we're at here. Let me just read this section to you, okay? Starting in uh, verse um, 45. Sorry, verse 46. Um, Those who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. So he's again talking about the temple. He says, but David didn't build the temple. Solomon is the one who built the temple. But listen to what he says, verse 48. Yet the Most High... This is Stephen to these leaders. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So Stephen's conclusion to all this is that God doesn't even dwell primarily in a temple. And this, this is really not cool. (laughs) in terms of what they're hearing him say. But then he, it gets even better at the end of the, of the speech here. Listen to what he says, verse 51. You stiff-necked people. That's a good start, isn't it? It gets, it gets better. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. I mean, that, yeah, ugh. Like, that is just, on many levels, like, Stephen is, is bringing some truth here to these religious leaders, okay? Then, he, then it gets even stronger. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Others did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, this is Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You, and this is the summary of it all, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And he just flips the script on him. You're accusing me, Stephen says, of not keeping the law and the prophets and following Moses. You all are the ones throughout history who have never kept the law, the, the practices of the temple, and actually reject your ancestors rejected Moses outright. And that brings us to verse 54, which we started with, which is why you can now see their response. Now, when they had heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. What is happening in this verse backed up through the whole account? Stephen is utterly exposing something in them. Now, just think about this with me. These, this is the synagogue of the freedmen. This isn't their official name, okay? This, these are people who are of Greek background, so they're not, they're not Jewish ethnically. They're probably diaspora Jews, which means out of the exile, generationally, they were raised in the, in the Greek Gentile world. But uh, they're, so we know that because they're Cyrenians, Alexandrians, Sicilia, they're from modern-day Turkey, Likely, according to most commentators, they had at some point been enslaved. But they had been granted freedom, which is why they're called the synagogue of the freedmen. Oh, who are the people in that synagogue? Oh, they're the people who were once in bondage and enslaved, and now they're actually free. And if you think about their journey, understandably so, why would they want to go back to being in any kind of slavery? So the temple, think about it with me, the temple and the law and the customs of Moses that they're so scared are going to be changed were probably the structures in place that sh- secured them. And if these things changed, if as Stephen is proposing that Jesus does, if these things are deconstructed, it, it very well could mean a loss of power or a loss they have enjoyed. And so, when the things that we have relied on most deeply for our sense of place in the world are threatened, it is an exposure of how critical it was to the infrastructure of identity. What is going They're scared their switch is going to be taken. They are so scared that this Jesus is going to come into their world and come into their city and he's going to destroy the temple and he's going to obliterate the law, and he, and the, and he is going to change things. He's going to change the customs. 
that we have so become so precious to us and we have, sa- we have found so much identity in them. And this, my friends, is exactly what Jesus does. Make no mistake. When he comes into your life, when he gets into the inner parts of your heart, you're open to his spirit working in you. He comes and he will obliterate those things that we find our deepest sense of our identity in other than him. This is an absolute exposure of the idol in these religious leaders' life. They had turned their religion into an idol. And this is part of Stephen's point, is they're not seeing God. They're seeing the constructs around God. And I would argue that welcome to the last two years of our cultural moment, our nation is the equivalent of a giant arcade where all of our switches are being taken away or threatened. And so many are freaking out, throwing temper tantrums, blaming others, and deeply offended. So many are on edge. Vengeance is so high. What is happening? (laughs) We're all afraid we're going to lose our switch. We are so afraid that the switches of our lives, the switches in our lives that we have put our identity in are going to be stripped from us. And whether your switch this morning is freedom, you feel like that is your switch, your switch of freedom that is being threatened, or maybe you feel this morning like it's your switch of safety that is being threatened, or maybe you feel that your rights in this cultural context in this nation are being threatened, whether that's the right to vote or whether that's a right to own a gun or you can fill in the blank with whatever right you're particularly passionate about, or whether you feel like it's your time that's being threatened. What is our response when something is taken away that we have found our, we have built our lives upon to the extent that our core identity is found in it? What does this lead to? I love James 1, 14 and 15, okay? But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I think this is a way of James saying, fall in love with something other than Jesus himself. Here's what happens. The desire that we have for that thing is conceived. It gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. And that is exactly what happens in this account. And this is our second observation, vengeance. First, the exposure of vengeance. Let's just think about how this unfolds here. But he full of the holy man standing at the right hand of God, and now listen to their response. Hear the vengeance. Hear the anger. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed at him. And they, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I want us to understand there is a violence that is inherent to our idolatry. And idolatry at play in our lives is a direct violation to the glory of God. And our idolatry unchecked, unconsidered, will always lead to the violation of some other person. Because when we find our identity, and when we wrap our identity up in some thing, and that thing is taken away, or that thing is threatened, whoever the person is, or whatever system, or whatever group of people you perceive is threatening that thing, do you know what? Their own rights. And we see this playing out. In the extreme situations, our idolatry leads to the murder of others. And this is Jesus' teaching, that if you look at your brother and have hate in your heart, you are murdering him or her. Following Jesus, I mean, make no mistake, especially if you're here and you're thinking like, man, 
Jesus is drawing me to himself. I am drawn into this message. I'm drawn into who he is. I'm seeing how he lived. I'm seeing how he interacted with people, and I'm drawn to him. There are enormous blessings that come with following Jesus. I mean, your life will be forever transformed for good, and you will flourish, and you will have so much peace and joy, but it is not a guarantee that anything in this world will go easy for you. In fact, in many situations, it will go much harder for you. Power and authority and idol in the world as we know it. And you will be banging on the gates of hell. And in some extreme cases, and we have brothers and sisters around the world who's, who are subjected to this week by week, day by day, your life may be demanded of you. It's probably unlikely for most of us in this room, but certainly you may be marginalized. Certainly you may be um, judged. Certainly you may be put out for some reason because you stand for Christ and what he teaches in this word. There are certainly areas of our culture that what Jesus teaches fits right in line with the culture, and the culture says, yes! And there are other things that run right against the grain of the culture. And we get to walk this line following Christ through the power of his spirit. I mean, think about just this last week. On Monday, we celebrated the life of a hero of the faith, Martin Luther King Jr., who opened up this word, and he said, and people were so threatened by it that they murdered him for it. They hated him for it. I know now we say, Martin Luther King Jr., a great man. In that day, he was hated. His house was bombed, and he was ultimately shot to death. Because he stood in line with Christ's vision for the world. And this ought to convict us to the core. And not to say how much are we like Stephen, because we're going to look at that in a moment here as a third observation, but to say how much are we like the synagogue of the freedmen. Because there's a lot more of the synagogue and the freedmen in my heart than there is Stephen in my heart, if that makes sense. I am so much more likely and quick to judge and to bring vengeance of forgiveness. This passage doesn't just give us this painful reality of the effects of our idols, of the effects of the idolatry. It actually also gives us this alternative, countercultural response to people when we are wronged or violated or when our switch is, in fact, taken away. Listen to Stephen's response again here. And I just, I want us to appreciate this moment. Here people are picking up rocks, boulders, and crushing the man with these rocks. Standing over him, stoning him to death. Okay? And here's what he says. And falling to his knees, he can't even stand because he's being beaten down by these rocks. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. And this is, make no mistake here, this is a proclamation. Luke wants us to hear. It was he cried out with a loud voice. Okay, This was heard by everybody there. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he died. Now, so dear being threatened. They are the freemen. <laughs> the object of their affection is religion, and that leads them to this bondage of fear of losing their power and privilege, and it ultimately leads them to inflict even, even murdering him. Think about the irony of this. But then, in juxtaposition, you have this other person in the account, Stephen, the one who actually loses something. He actually is losing his life in real time. He is the one who's not a free man, but he's a bound man. But the object of his affection is Jesus Christ, and we're going to see that in a moment, free and fearless of losing his very life. He's fearless. The religious leaders are riddled with fear. They haven't even lost anything. They're just, their tradition is being threatened. Here Stephen is on the brink of losing his life, and what does this lead him to? Not holding anything against them? Forgiveness? Mercy? <sighs> like, what kind? How, how is that possible? It is so 
dynamically juxtaposed. The people who say and want freedom are the ones who are actually completely bound, slaves to fear, and are willing to murder somebody. And the person who's actually bound, who has found his identity in something else other than a switch in this world, so to speak, he is completely free, fearless, willing to give his life, and then he's willing to forgive the people and not hold against the people who are actually picking up rocks to throw at him. And how many of us, when somebody picks up a, thro- a stone to throw it at you, can you imagine that someone attacks you with words on Facebook, social media? Hey, I just, I just want to say, like, I don't agree with your perspective, but listen, I hold nothing against you. I have nothing but love and forgiveness in my heart for you. You can say whatever you want to me. You could take my life. There is nothing in my heart towards you but forgiveness and grace and mercy. I hold nothing against you. How does Stephen have this kind of poise? What causes Stephen to look at his persecutors and not be defensive, but to say in love, I do not hold anything against you? And we find it in the object of Stephen's affection. We find it right in verse 55, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazing, wants you to see the contrast here. We tend to, in our world, in the culture we live in, we look inward, we look internally, we want to know how our feelings are, we, we look at our switches, we're enamored by our switches, we get drunk on those things, And of course, when those things are removed from us or taken from us, we are so offended and we are so hurt and it's so traumatic because we have found so much identity in this thing here. But look at Stephen. Stephen is gazing through the veil into another reality. And who does he see? He sees the righteous one standing there. The Pharisees could only see, the religious leaders could only see their idol being taken away. But Stephen in this moment, he can only see Jesus. And therefore, he has no reason to defend himself. He does not have to make a defense for himself. He does not have to justify himself. He does not have to even say, please stop stoning me. He doesn't even say that. He says, Lord, I see you. I feel the pain from them. And I forgive them. Forgive them. Don't hold this against them. Romans 8.27 says, The Spirit of God continually intercedes for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Jesus always, Jesus lives to always make intercession for us. 1 John 2.1 says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This is the picture that Stephen sees. Jesus is standing in heaven. In many cases, Places in the scripture we see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand. But here it's what we read earlier. Jesus sees the Son of Man standing. It's almost like Jesus is peering right back down at Stephen and seeing him being stoned to death. It's like, that is my son. I am with you. I am standing here with you. Be strong. You will be with me soon and you have nothing to defend. I love you and you can therefore forgive him. And that's exactly his posture. That's exactly what he does. F.F. Bruce, the theologian, says this. Stephen had been confessing Christ before man, and now he sees Christ confessing him before God. When the gospel gets into you, you have nothing to defend. You can be wrong. You can be violated. You can be yelled at. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue justice in the world, okay? That don't, that's not what this message is about. I'm saying for you personally, You don't have to fight for yourself. You have one who fights for you. And how do you know that? Because Jesus himself laid his life down for you. He, in love, was crucified, put to death. He did what Stephen did. He did it first, and Stephen saw that. And therefore, Stephen was able to, to the extent that we are able to see Christ crucified for us in love and raised to life in power, is the extent to which we are able to let go of our switches. We're able to see Jesus is lifted up, and we're able to extend grace to one another. 
I don't hold anything against you, whoever that person is, whatever that situation is. Like, I, I, I'm not agreeing, I don't have to agree with you, I'm not necessarily agreeing with you. What you're saying to me hurts me, but I, I have nothing for you but forgiveness and love and mercy. What if, it was, what, if it, what if our prayer was something like this? I do not hold anything against the person who I pass who looks at me demanding that I get the vax. I remember who has judged me or not allowed me to come to their home because of our differences or convictions. I do not hold anything against the leaders of my nation who weren't experts and aren't experts in how to handle a pandemic. I don't hold anything against the news media outlets that continually share perspectives that are maybe confusing and maybe we feel like they're only perpetuating one view. I don't hold anything against the person who throws stones at me. I don't have to defend myself. I have one who defends me still. And the only way this is possible is for a kind of love to enter into your condition that is beautiful enough and radiant enough and powerful enough to blanket your insecurities, to squelch them, to evaporate them, to loosen your grip on your switches, to know that we have one who defends us forever. Jesus Christ has done this, and he will continue to do this for you. Let's pray. Father, there's a lot of pain at play in the world right now. And there are so many, and we would include ourselves in this, who continually look at our switches to find a sense of security or freedom or identity. And Lord, we're saying that we want you to be the object of our affection, that beyond the good things in this world, that we see and have, we would see you as ultimate. We would see you as the object of our affection and whatever situation we found ourselves in, we would look through the situation and see you standing in heaven advocating for us. And we thank you that this is reality, that this is your heart for us, that you love us, even when we fall into idolatry, even when we get defensive, Lord, you do not hold anything against us because through the cross, the righteous one gave us righteousness. And so we stand in that, not as something that we derived ourselves, but something that has been imputed to us. And we thank you for that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that you know who they need to forgive and you know how to turn the posture of their hearts towards one that doesn't hold things against people. And we know, Jesus, you're the only one who can overthrow the switches of our lives. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week we have the opportunity to hear the gospel proclaimed and then we have the opportunity to partake in the gospel um, through sharing a meal with our brothers and sisters around the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we find Paul writes, For I received thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ for you. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. And 1 Corinthians 11 goes on um, to say that we should examine ourselves and then eat the bread and drink the cup. And the heart behind this, we believe in this passage, is this is not a long time and this morning is a moment of return. Come freely. The table is open. 
If you're here this morning and your heart, your teeth are grinding and your heart is hard and you are, have been running from Christ, then we would encourage you to wait, pray, ask the Lord to change your heart, process with someone. There's no judgment for you not to come. So you discern that and you come as you feel free, but just know there's freedom to not come, um, even as there's freedom to come. Um, we can come from the sides uh, and back up through the middle as we sing this last song together.
As a worshiping community, we respond to God's grace in many ways, in some way, through this body. We would love to encourage you to do that. We'd love to sit with you and just hear what that could look like. What vision do you have? We have a number of teams here within the four walls, so to speak, and a number of teams way outside the four walls doing stuff uh, So we in the estuary. So we would love to encourage you in that. Uh, we'd also love to encourage you um, to give regularly, and we thank you for those who are members here who do that. Um, we give out of the overflow of God's grace. You can give online. You can also give through the offering box in the back. And for those who maybe have not had a chance to start that with us, we practice something called First Roots Giving. So as God gives and offers you, uh, you know, whatever resource for the generosity of this church um, over the years, and, um, and thank you for that. I was thinking that on a morning like this morning in the passage we read, probably all of us have someone in our life that metaphorically are either trying to steal our switch or are throwing rocks at us. Are you with me here? So I just want to take 30 seconds here in quiet and invite you standing at the right hand of the Father, the Spirit of God, to prompt your heart. At the right hand of the Father, we thank you that the heavens are open and your grace has been poured out. And I pray that through the power of your spirit, you would give us strength to act upon, to take those steps you've called us to, whether that's to forgive, to have a conversation. Maybe it's in our hearts, Lord. You know, but we pray we would be a people who live holding nothing against anyone. We thank you that you defend us. And pray.